Well, it's nice to be here again. I think the last time was in February and it was very cold. It's, it is nice to come here in the summer, I must confess. Driving in the daylight, going back in the daylight is great. Anyway, greetings from the folk at Newtown. Um, we, we keep up to speed down there about Chartridge from certain quarters. So all is well and vice versa, I suppose, actually, yeah. Um, so it is great to be with you and to uh, share worship together. We read these words in Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech, they use no words, no sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens God has pitched a tent for the sun. It's like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They're more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned, in keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins, may they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Well, tonight we're going to be thinking about the power of words and indeed the tongue, that well-known passage in James chapter 3. We'll be looking at under the title, Taming the Tongue. Well, you know, I like to bring a little story, usually a hymn story, it's a very little one today. It's about a chap called Edward Moat. No Edward Moat? It's a name I've seen there, and I've, I've not thought of much about him other than when I started work as a, a trainee accountant 50 odd years ago in uh, Harrow Borough Council, the previous borough treasurer had been a Harry Moat. And I'd never seen the name before other than in the Bible. And it kind of amused me because, of course, take the, the moat out of your eye, but not any more in the, the modern versions. But Edward Moat, whether he was related to this other one, I don't know. But Edward Moat, whose uh, significant years are 1797 to 1874, is not one with a big story, but it's a, a lovely story. The hymn writers whose songs have influenced Christians through the years haven't always come from a Christian background. Edward Moat, the author of My Hope is Built on Nothing Less, The Solid Rock, on which I stand, Edward Moat grew up in an ungodly home in London. His parents were innkeepers and he knew nothing about God or the Bible. Moat was born in 1797 and, as a youth, was an apprentice to a cabinet maker. When he was a teenager, his master took him to hear the preaching of John Hyatt, an evangelist missionary who preached in the slums of London. Moat received Christ as his saviour and his life was greatly changed. This cabinet maker, because that's what he carried on doing for a while, had a great interest in writing and singing hymns. One morning as he walked to work, the lines came to his mind, On Christ the solid rock I stand, 
all other ground is sinking sand, which became the refrain. And by the end of the day, he had written four stanzas. The following Sunday, he was asked to call on a friend's wife, who was seriously ill. And in those days, when they visited, someone would sing a hymn or read the Bible. And I'm sure that happens today, doesn't it, when we visit people? Well, Moat couldn't find his hymnal. So he used the verses he had just written and sang the verses to the melody of a well-known hymn. The words ministered so to the wife that she asked for a copy. Moat went home, wrote two more stanzas, and took a copy to the dying woman. He published the song two years later, in 1836, in a collection called Hymns of Praise, a new selection of gospel hymns. It's suggested that this is the first time the term gospel hymn was used. Well, at the age of 55, Moke became a Baptist preacher, and he built the building for the strict Baptist church in Horsham. Out of gratitude for their pastor, the congregation offered to give him the deed to the property, because they'd built it. His response was, I do not want the chapel. I only want the pulpit. And when I cease to praise Christ, then turn me out of that. He served there for over 20 years until poor health caused him to resign in 1873, one year before his death. Well, we haven't got many hymns from Moat in the hymn book. It's 473, if you'd like to find it. And I will read you the other two verses, which I have here. Most hymn books only have the, the four verses, really. This was the original. Nor earth nor hell my soul can move. I rest upon unchanging love. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. The refrain is the same. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Mid all the hell I feel within, on his completed work I lean. When darkness fails his lovely face, I rest upon unchanging grace. In every rough and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. His oath, his covenant and his blood supports me in the sinking flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. I trust his righteous character, his counsel, promise and his power. His honour and his name's at stake to save me from the burning lake. When I shall launch in worlds unseen, oh, may I then be found in him, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. And the verse that it's referenced back to is 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11, For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid which is Jesus Christ. James chapter 3 and the first 12 verses. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they're steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body 
sets the course of one's life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Mm. If only this were true. There's great power in speech, isn't there? We have the facility of speech and it can be used well, it can be used badly. A fluent speaker can whip a crowd up into a frenzy. A stumbling speaker can turn people off. A panic-stricken individual can cause further panic to his hearers. A voice of authority can quell fears. The voice, what we say, is very powerful, isn't it? The tongue is powerful. We see this in the world. We see this in the church. We may well have suffered tongue lashings ourselves in the past. Or we may remember the honeyed words of a saint of God and we wanted more and more. Using our tongues then is something we do every day. Have you ever thought, how many words do I speak? How much do I say? How many things have come out that really shouldn't have come out? We need to consider carefully then how we use our words. We might not have ever used a gun or a sword in anger, but we may have used what we said as a weapon against someone. And we need to be so, so careful. A sharp tongue can be even more dangerous a weapon than a gun or a sword. Well, it was obviously a problem within the early church because James is spending time in this letter, this letter written to Jewish background believers, he spends quite a good part of the letter dealing with issues arising from wrong use of the tongue. There are references to the right and wrong ways of speaking. Early on in the letter, if you look at chapter 1 and verse 19, a very salutary lesson. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And in verse 26 of chapter 1, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. In chapter 2 and verse 16, under the section headed in the NIV, Faith and Deeds, verse 16, someone is saying to another person, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, and doing nothing about it. Empty words mentioned there. The right use of the God-given gift of speech is therefore important, and we need to think about it. Yes, it's very practical, but James's letter is very practical, and we need, I think, like is suggested, to look in a mirror and just think about ourselves, and I, I certainly need to do that, particularly as you will, will see. So, three headings tonight. Why say anything? If it's so dangerous, why are we saying anything? Secondly, a particular warning to those who would be teachers. And thirdly, a common problem, the tongue. 
for each one of us to take heed. So why say anything? Well, the facility to communicate using a breadth of words and language is pretty much unique to human beings, isn't it? Yeah, they say that dolphins communicate a bit, but they don't really have a big conversation that uh, goes on for a long time. Monkeys, cats, birds, yeah, they, they're kind of communicating, but it's nothing like the gift we've been given by God to speak to one another and understand one another. Men and women, boys and girls, most of people on the planet Earth can talk to one another, can speak words, expressions, phrases, sentences, the things <coughs> that come to us almost naturally. Yes, we've had to learn them as a baby, but isn't it wonderful? Isn't it amazing what comes from such a, a small organ? Larynx, the tongue, all that. We take it for granted. But what a wonderful God we have who's designed us that we can communicate one with another. And it's only when we lose our voice, maybe through an infection or something like that, that we realize how much we rely on speech. I don't know if you remember back four years now to, to lockdown, when we couldn't really interact much with anybody. That was bad enough, but if there were people in your house and people nearby, you did a bit. But when people were kind of isolated, it was, it was bad. But we are social beings created by God, aren't we? And the human voice is amazing. We can speak softly or loudly, harshly, or in a winsome way. And we convey what we're thinking through the tone of our voice. Imagine a parent and a child comes up to them with something they, they've drawn, a wonderful piece of artwork, well, according to the child. <laughs> Goes up to the parent, shows the parent, and the pa parent looks away from their mobile device and goes, that's interesting. What's that saying to the child? However, wow, that's really good. Totally different. And we have that, again, given us by God to be able to show emotion in our voice. Human voice box is amazing. So why, why speech? Why do we talk? Why do we do so? Well, number one, because we are made in the image of God. He speaks. He spoke creation into being. Genesis 1 has at least 14 references to God speaking. And it was so. The man Adam and the woman Eve both spoke in the Garden of Eden before the fall, didn't they? Second reason why speak because we are called to praise God with our lips. You just go through the Psalms, including the one we had at the start of the service. We are to extol the Lord, to sing, to glorify, to proclaim, and so much more. How do you do it if you're silent? You can't. So you use your lips there. Look at Ephesians 5. There's uh, an instruction there under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Paul wrote in chapter 5, verses 18 to 19. Well, let's start at the beginning of 18. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. And then also, we are to use this gift of speech to encourage one another, to lift one another up. A kind word can often go a long way. A couple of references from Proverbs here, and there are loads more. 
Proverbs 12, 25. Anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. And then chapter 16 of Proverbs, verse 24. Gracious words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. I like that. Gracious words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. And the other reason for why speak is this, to advance the cause of the gospel. We have opportunities given us. We often say that we witness to people. What does a witness do in a court of law? They tell plainly of what they know. And we can do that through what we say to people. Yes, how we live before them, that's true. But also through backing up our deeds with our words or the other way round. Christians can testify, that is witness for their Lord, what he's done in their life and what he is going to do when they die, that they'll be with him. We're told to proclaim and to share the gospel and we can do it with the gift of speech. Well, that's some of the responsibilities. Why have we got it? That's some of the reasons. But let's go on to the warnings, back to James chapter 3. And there is a particular warning in verses 1 and 2. Word particularly addressed to teachers. Particularly those in likely to be in those sort of positions within a church. But it does have application for all of us, really, as you will see. Because sometimes we help others by showing them things from the scripture. Well, that's kind of teaching. Although here it's probably talking about those who had formal authority in the church. But let's listen to what the, the Lord says here. James probably had Jewish background teachers in his mind, those who had liked to be called rabbi, to be noticed, those sort of people. They could well have been um, from that kind of background and maybe were still bringing it with them. Such teachers might be great in their own eyes, but were they in God's eyes? You remember Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. He was a Pharisee, member of the Jewish council of the Sanhedrin, came by night, he didn't want to be seen. But Jesus had words for him. You must be born again. You, you know very well what uh, the conversation went into. But in verse 10, you get this. You are Israel's teacher and you do not understand these things. The person who was supposed to teach others, Nicodemus, didn't understand himself any of the fundamentals that Jesus was teaching him. So how could Nicodemus then teach others? His credibility was in question. To be a teacher, to tell other gospel things, matters of life and death, is a high calling. It's an awesome responsibility. The opportunity to speak of these things is a great privilege, but it's an awesome responsibility. Paul, who we consider to be a great servant of the gospel, knew that. He had a very low opinion of himself and he gave all the glory to God. In Ephesians 3 verse 8, Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ. To be a teacher of God's word then is a noble thing not to be taken lightly. And James here wants to put the record straight. He recognises that no teacher will be perfect. Verse 2 tells us that. These teachers are no better than anyone else in terms of their, their background in sin, but they have this extra responsibility now and they need to fulfil it well in God's sight. And that's awesome for 
people who stand in the pulpit, teach in the Sunday school, teach in ladies' meeting, all that kind of stuff. It's a profound privilege, but it's a great responsibility, as I say. Therefore, clowning around in the pulpit is not wise, is not right. Being flippant with the things of God, some people are, that's not right either. Preachers and teachers should use their words carefully. Speak as a dying man to dying men. Huge responsibility then. But Jesus has words for, for teachers. Luke 12. Luke 12, verse 48. From everyone who's been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who's been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. Pray for gospel preachers and teachers in our land today. It's so easy in these days of small things to be tempted by the quick winds. There's some churches where they'll be having a sort of disco thing tonight, I'm sure. Let's stick to the truth. Let's stick to the Lord. The gospel is not entertainment. People will be entertained to death. The gospel is the good news about Jesus Christ and it's life. And it's life to the full. That's the message we should be proclaiming. But let's go in particularly now then to the tongue. Not what teachers say, but what all of us may say, not say. Let's look at the tongue. And the first thing we should note is that it is extremely powerful. These pictures in James are vivid, aren't they? They're great pictures. If we can direct our tongues, we can direct our lives. We need to control our tongues, not to be controlled by them. And the pictures here are of a horse and a ship. First one then, let's picture a horse, a fine stallion or mare, strong legs racing down that course at Ascot, or maybe in the, the Grand National, jumping fences. How does the jockey control that horse? Through the bit. A piece of metal, rubber or plastic that applies pressure to the horse's mouth and which is itself attached to the bridle and reins. That's what causes the horse to go that way or that way. Yes, they get it to go faster, but maybe by giving it a little kick. But the direction it goes in is, is the one that is dictated by the way in which that bit is being uh, influenced. An animal weighing up to something like 400 kilograms can be directed by a man or a woman an eighth of that weight because of that. Incredible, isn't it? Okay, hold that in your head. And then think about a ship. Maybe today you might think of an oil tanker or a container ship or a warship or an aircraft carrier. One of those great big vessels. What controls the direction in which that ship is going? The rudder. The tiny item at the ship's rear. The stern? Is that right? <laughs> I think it's the stern, yeah, the, the, the back of the ship. Even though there may be many other forces seeking to drive the ship along, maybe the waves, the wind, certainly in the olden days that was the case, the rudder has the greatest influence in directing the ship in the way it should go. Again, it's a tiny, tiny part. Apparently it's a tenth of 1%. Tenth of 1% of the whole structure but it has a disproportionate influence. If the rudder is under control, the ship is under control. Given the sort of boats that they had in James's day, this was a matter of life and death. The ship had to go where you wanted it to go. Well, he goes on to say, likewise, the tongue 
is very small, but it's very, very powerful. And so it can make great boasts. It can be used for good or evil. It can go either way. James is suggesting that it often doesn't go the right way. If it goes the wrong way, there are disastrous consequences. That's where James, of course, develops the picture into the fact that the tongue can be extremely destructive. What we say can cause untold hurt. And this is where we get the other picture, of course, of a great forest fire set off by a tiny spark. I don't need to ask you to visualise that, really, do I? In recent years, there were some in um, Australia, there are some in Greece very recently. There were some in Greek islands last year. Great big fires, swathes of countryside, burnt down. Indeed, we had some in the UK, didn't we? Not too, was it last year, year before? Over London Way, discarded cigarette. A barbecue left smouldering. Just a spark and devastation on a large scale. A small spark is all that's required. Well, James, again, is using that picture to focus our minds. He's telling us that the tongue is like this, a seemingly small thing, a little thing, a careless word, for example, can turn into a major disaster in the home, in the family, in the church. 2020 saw the 850th anniversary of Thomas a Becket's murder in Canterbury Cathedral. Many historians, certainly when I was at school, believed that this happened because a group of knights overheard King Henry II saying, will no one rid me of this turbulent priest? And they acted upon what they'd heard. Now he didn't mean it, it seems, because he, there was a lot of penance that he did subsequently. But those words were taken possibly out of context and there was murder committed. You can see how people's passions can get inflamed by people in authority. People who perhaps should know better, I won't go into the details, you see it on the news, but there are rabble-rousers in various nations of the world. The tongue is dangerous, small, but not insignificant, extremely dangerous. The tongue can burn with a fire from the place where fires never go out. That is hell. If you go to Matthew chapter 15, you find the Lord Jesus speaking about this. The Lord Jesus speaks about what comes out of a person. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, that's what defiles them. And then he explains what that means later in that chapter. Our tongues can speak with poison because they can be hellish. We can be influenced by the evil one. Pray that you won't be. But we do need to be very aware of these things. So the tongue is powerful, it's destructive, and thirdly, James reinforces his message by telling us that naturally speaking, our tongues are ungovernable. That actually they run away with us if we're not careful. And he draws our attentions to the animals. Another picture, we've got it, haven't we? in verses 7 and 8. He contrasts the animals. Animals can be trained, generally speaking. It's fair to say. Uh, my son has got himself a puppy in the last six months, and I've seen him deal with this puppy. This puppy is absolutely scared stiff of Andrew now, I think. Martin and Pat will have seen the early days of the puppy, and she was all over the place, wasn't she, really? Now, stay there. We can tame animals. 
But the tongue, can we tame that? Well, it says here, no human being can tame the tongue. So what's the hope? Well, the hope is that the Lord Jesus coming into our lives has made the difference that our tongues then become under his sovereignty as all of our bodies are and we submit to him. We think about what we're saying. We wonder whether it would honour him to say such and such a thing, to not say something in a certain situation. We need to be careful that our unregenerate self, if you like, doesn't surface. Yes, I know it. You know, we can't be unregenerate again. But if we're Christians, we need to subject the tongue, just like we subject every aspect of our life, to the sovereignty of Christ. We have to think through. He, our Saviour, never uttered a word that was inappropriate, flippant, or wrong. His words were perfect. They were like words from that honeycomb. So should our words be. So we do need to review what we say, how we say it, when we say it, don't we? Yes, our tongues are the overflow of our hearts. This is a very humbling passage. Our hearts, if they're full of Christ, should influence our words to be equally full of him. But we can so easily be taken in by emotion. Let's pray that we will be those who are good ambassadors for him, good witnesses for him indeed, as we are called to do. The tongue, you see, is a kind of spiritual barometer it reveals what's going on inside us if you look at verses 9 to 12 as we close you'll see that we are contradictory people the jews open and close each day with blessings upon god but in between there'll be cursing men we're not to be like that the Christian who can pray to the Lord in exalted language, but who breathes ridicule at everybody who does not quite live up to his expectations, has not faced his own depravity. We need to, you know, take that beam out of our own lie before we take that moat out of somebody else's. It's a humbling passage. It's a, a simple message we've got here in one respect. James says in verse 10, Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. And goes on to explain why. If our hearts are on fire for the Lord, we won't be breathing fire on other people. We'll be breathing balm. We'll be those people who are coming alongside others and who will be those who have those honeyed words. We should be using our tongues for good, not for evil. Quick to listen, slow to speak. The spirit of this age is to make yourself heard. As Christians, yes, we should be speaking of our Saviour. That's what we're told to do. But not by battering people not shouting at them. <coughs> we should be winsome in order to win some. Jesus and then James give us instructions then. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount says, let your yes be yes. Let your no, no. Christians should be people of integrity, not people of many words. People who honour the Saviour, above all, in their words and deeds. May we be like that. Let's pray that that is the case. May he help us to do so. Amen. <laughs>